suddenly I had a disease. Suddenly I had a mental illness. And of course, you know, when everyone's telling you, you've got a mental illness, I, you're, I was 13. What the hell did I know? And so I started behaving like somebody with a mental illness that even though I'd thought about almost nothing but killing myself for seven years, I didn't want to. Because I could have that night, if I'd really wanted to die, just because I think something doesn't mean it's true. And that one realization multiplied and repeated many, many times that just because you've got thoughts in your head doesn't mean they're what you think. We are not our thinking. We are that which thinks. See, we all think that it comes from, well, they made me feel that, and this made me feel that, and that's just a stressful situation, and that's just a high-pressure industry. But there's no such thing as a stressful situation or a high pressure industry. Welcome, Michael Neal, to Turning Your Adversity into an Asset podcast with Lewis Raymond Taylor. So today, um, we get the privilege of speaking to a four times best selling author. Did I get that facts right? Well, it's six, Lewis, but. Oh my God! We haven't updated. You haven't had. Sorry, by, the, by the time anyone's done with my bio, I always think I'm going to be taller, but it doesn't really make any difference. <laughs> okay, so six. Well, what, that congratulations on the extra two that I wasn't aware of. Um, but four is pretty impressive, as it is to be honest. I'm still working on number one, and I think a lot of people and I would know you and me specifically um, from. Super coach. I don't know if that's your best seller of your best seller. Uh, that's just an assumption. No, it, 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 it is. It, yeah, it was a very po it, popular book. Actually, the, there's one called The Inside Out Revolution, which is the one that is in the most laid. I don't know, I think 26 languages. And, you know, that's the one that's really it, that, that one impressed me. I was like, oh, so that one was that one was more a, a bigger bestseller than Super Coach. Yeah, and I think just because it it probably has a broader broader appeal. Like in other words, it was it was not sort of super coachy kind of. That's going to limit the number of people. It's like oh god, what is that? that sounds terrible, right? Whereas Inside Out Revolution is vague enough that I think it appealed to more people. But uh, it wasn't it wasn't deliberate. It just that's how it happened. So let's start there. Let's start with Super Coach because I've I've read that book um, and it was actually a number of years ago. And I wish I, no offense, but obviously you know that we forget a lot of books, a lot of things that are in books. So I wish I could paraphrase more that was in that book. But it's, I, I'd, it's storm, I'd storm off in a huff, but it, it you know I got nowhere to go. It's a little room, really. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, say, I apologize for that. I can remember parts of it, but it's you know. When we're when we're reading books and we're listening to podcasts and watching videos, we're absorbing all that stuff, and you know we're not always consciously aware of where that came from or can paraphr paraphrase exact parts. But there would have been parts of you that are now inside me. Oh my god, that sounded fucking terrible. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but, you're doing uh, great. Keep it up. This is great. Some people may have got that that uh, joke. Some people may not. But that wasn't meant to be a joke. But yeah, there are parts of your. Uh, knowledge, shall I say, that have, um, you know, formed part of my development as a coach, because I, I read it at very beginning stages, probably about seven years ago now. Um, so what are the key takeaways from Supercoach to someone that hasn't uh, read that book? Because as we know, it's bestseller, um, very popular book. And, um, you know, you're, you're, you're one of the, you know, listed as in some of the top coaches in the world alongside, uh, some of the very, very best in the industry. So I should imagine you try and put your best golden nuggets and gems into that book. So I'd love to start with, yeah, some of the some of the golden nuggets and wisdom that you shared within Supercoach, because for anyone that hasn't read that, um, they might be able to get a little bit of an insight now. Yeah, in a way, it, was, it wasn't so much just the best bits as much as the bits that aren't obvious to most people. Because, in other words, there's a lot of stuff about success that's pretty obvious to anyone who's tried. Like, you got to show up and go to work. There's, I haven't found a shortcut for that one. Um, but mm -hmm. most people, and I include myself in this as something I didn't see till I saw it, really think that what we're up against is all outside us. Like, the world is the, you know, the, either the mountain we're going to climb or the enemy we're going to conquer or the battlefield we're going to prove ourselves on. And, and we don't actually see that we're living in a world of thought. Like people talk about positive thinking, but they think it's about thinking positively about real things. 
Like, how can I have a better attitude towards fear? How can I have a better attitude towards money? How can I have a better attitude towards, and you know, when people are antagonistic towards me and things like that, not realizing that fear and perceived antagonism and even money are made of thought. They're not real things. Like I can show you cash, but you don't suffer from cash. People don't suffer from the actual physical bills. It's whatever their idea of money is that either makes money easier or harder. It's whatever their understanding of fear is that makes it easier or harder to, to deal with in their lives. It's whatever their understanding of where their feelings come from. See, we all think that it comes from, well, they made me feel that, and this made me feel that, and that's just a stressful situation, and that's just a high-pressure industry. But there's no such thing as a stressful situation or a high-pressure industry. Stress and pressure are internally generated. And the fact that we habitually generate them in some pretty similar places makes it look like, oh, it must be to do with business. It must be to do with achievement. It really isn't. And you, I'm guessing you've met enough people to realize not everybody reacts the same way to those issues. Some people come alive. Some people are way better. They fall apart like if they go camping. But, you know, if they're in a business meeting with 10 people who want to eat them for lunch, they're like, oh, this finally I can relax. Like that. That's, and, and, and when you start to see that, you realize you have a lot more say. I, I don't think you actually have control, but you have a lot more say in how you show up. How, how good you are able to feel, how easy it is to be at your best in a wide, wide variety of situations. Yeah, the key thing that I'm picking up here and that is a, is a common theme throughout the podcast that I do is, uh, is perspective. You know, it's a perspective of how you see these things and these thoughts and how you allow them to influence your life. And uh, they, they vary on a huge spectrum, of course. And uh, books like your... Uh, super coach book, I guess, allows people to see that different perspective and apply it to their life. Um, so, okay, cool. So, so, stepping back a little bit, what what got you into the world of coaching and 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 gave you uh, the position in which that you was able to you know teach people to become that super coach? Well, it, for me, it it started out. I I I just was trying to survive. Like I I was a messed up kid, and um. And, and so I got interested in personal development and spiritual development and all that stuff to cope, you know, and then at a certain point, I'd absorbed enough to use your metaphor of like absorbing, you know, that I, I realized that I could help other people. And even though I had no particular interest in it, I set up as a therapist because I sort of trained as one because that was where I learned what I needed to learn in that kind of format. That's, that's, can I just, sorry, I'd like to interrupt you there because... I've had we've had a little bit of criticism over the over the years sometimes of um we because we help people develop their mindset, change their lives, and as a result of that transformation, they then feel compelled to go out there and share that with others. And that's been my journey. You know, I and 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 by the sounds of it, your journey as well. You know, you wanted to develop your life, you learned how to develop your life, and then it made sense. I've now got a skill set and a superpower that I didn't have before to now go and share that. Now we've been criticised before over, you know, quote unquote, exploiting vulnerable people because they are not in the position to be a coach yet. For example, right? And we use the the sort of analogy, or I guess, or metaphor of, uh, or even the saying become your first client, you know, develop yourself to the point where you are in a position to help other people and don't s stop yourself not being great, start in order to become great, you know? So for me, it was almost the, up. coaching was my solution to that, not the problem. So I got to a point where I hated that the people who came to me who really, really, really needed help, that, that I was trying to make my living off them. Now, I wasn't charging a lot when I started. I was at 33 pounds for two hours. I mean, I was hardly exploiting anybody. But 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 there was something uncomfortable about that, that people who really were in pain had to come up with money for me to help them get out of pain. I didn't like the model. And so I actually stopped. Um, I, I you, you know, you said you like stories. I'll tell you a story. I there was a particular client and she'd come to me with agoraphobia and she she literally was driven to me on the back seat of her boyfriend's car under a pile of coats 
She was so scared of being out in the world. And I worked with her for two hours and uh, it seemed to go really well. Like she walked out on her own and I thought, oh, okay, I think that was really good. She left a message on my answering machine. Remember answering machines, kids? She left a message on my answering machine. Um, and I was literally had just, I, I had trained as an actor. That was why I was in London. And, and I had just got my first big job up in Manchester. And so I didn't respond to her message. The message was just, hey, Michael, please call me. And I thought, okay, if I can't be relied on to return somebody's call who in need, I, I shouldn't do this work. So for two years, I stopped seeing people at all, just did my acting. I got a call from her two years later and said, hi, Michael, you probably don't remember me. My name is, and, and I was like thinking, oh, I remember you. I quit my job because of you. Um, and she said, you know, would you, you know, would you be willing to come uh, have lunch with me? And I, I sort of have this suck it up thing where it's like, let's just get this over with whatever she's going to say to me, I deserve. So I, I was like, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll come. And I walk in and it's, I, it was like walking into an intervention. There, there was her, there was the boyfriend who I vaguely remembered. There were two people who I assumed were her parents and somebody I assumed was a grandmother. And I'm like, what the hell? Like it was, you just walk into this cafe in Stoke Newington and I'm like, okay. Um, but again, Suck it up. Let's 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 get the well, she she said, I you you probably never got my message, but I called you after our session because my entire life changed. She said, I was not afraid for the first time in my life. And I was so moved by it that I decided to get a degree in psychology. And I've been at university and I actually wanted to interview you for my thesis. And my boyfriend, now my fiance came because he wanted to thank you. And my parents came because they wanted to thank you. And my grandmother came. And I'm like, oh my God, you're why I quit. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, I need to rethink this. And I still didn't like the model of taking people who are really suffering and making money from them, even though I don't think it's exploitation. People have to make a living and people who can help have to make a living too. It's like, you pay nurses, why wouldn't you pay a therapist? That doesn't make sense to me. But it didn't sit with me and I found coaching and I thought, oh, wait, there's a way to help people who are OK. They're doing fine They're But they want more. And that was a group that a population, as it were, that I, I felt great about working with because it's like, look, if you don't work with me, you're still going to be OK. But boy, can it be so much more than it is right now? Yeah. And, and when I say exploiting the vulnerable, this is the criticism. I know I'm not uneducated and uninformed what what we what we try and do is we try and give everybody uh, the opportunity because who are we to say you don't have what it takes to become a coach you're not good enough to become a coach you don't have the skills you don't have the experience you're not well put together we can't say that and i'm not talking about people that are mentally ill or depressed but we've you know even successful people you know will have certain levels of vulnerability you know i i mean millionaires and you know celebrities that have crippling imposter syndrome or confidence issues or you know all sorts of vulnerabilities you know that would that you would never even expect and this happens within the coaching space as well and by going through coaching training like i mentioned you do go through you know the process of becoming your first client and you break down your own limiting beliefs and you shift your own perspective and you build confidence and you learn all these tools and techniques and models and frameworks and by going through that process you become a better person and a different person and more able to help other people as a result of that um and i just like the fact that yeah you you said that you started out because you know you you needed help yourself and then that led you into this career and i think that's most people's journey because it's it's not just something you pick out of thin air it's usually something that you know you have a personal experience with and you believe in you know you have to believe in something to be able to get behind it and want to do it and what better way to do that than to experience it this is very unlikely that a very well put together person who has a perfect mindset is going to decide to go and put themselves through vigorous personal development training. Yeah, it might. It might happen. Have, have you ever have you ever met that person? I'm just curious. I've, I've never I've never met them. That person no, who's kind of just got it all together. Yeah, it's usually something somebody that's got something holding them back, and that and that's like I mentioned, it's a perspective that could be little to somebody or large to somebody else. You know, the fact that you know 
there's a an executive female who finds it difficult to put her opinions forward in a meeting to some person to to that particular lady could be keeping her up at night could be making her feel like she is a failure could be making her feel insignificant could maybe even be making her feel inadequate in her relationships and 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 and, and even god forbid suicidal who who knows how far deep and far stretching that in fairly on the surface insignificant symptom could be you know and yeah that's why i i i always think we need to go on our own journey and for anybody who says you know somebody isn't ready to become a coach or somebody isn't ready to work on themselves or you know somebody should start basic or read a few books I, i think dive in learn all you can and when you're ready to help somebody help somebody you know you don't have to go out there and pretend you're the person that can I remember a woman um, phoning me about personal coaching. This was probably 20 years ago. And I I learned a real lesson from her about my arrogance. Um, And, and, and she, she, she called me and we had a chat about coaching and I didn't, I, I I kind of did that. I slightly pushed her away and not in a rude way, but I, I, I didn't follow up. She called again for a second session. And finally the, the third, uh, she reached out a third time and she said, what's wrong with me? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, why won't you consider me as a client? And I said, do you want an honest answer? And she said she did. And I said, well, first off, I'm pretty sure you're an alcoholic and you're lying about it. Because I could just tell. I don't know how I could tell. And she got really quiet. And she said, well, I do drink a lot. And I said, and, and secondly, in all honesty, from what I've picked up about your situation, in order to afford to hire me as a coach, you'd be living on cat food. And she said, well, that would be my choice, wouldn't it? And I had honestly never considered that it was incredibly patronizing of me, paternalistic, arrogant, whatever word you want, to decide who was worthy of being my client. You know, you know that I had to protect them from themselves. People are freaking amazing. They may be in horrible circumstances. They may be lost in their heads. They may be struggling with all sorts of things. But underneath that, they're still amazing. That's why what we do works. So that was a real lesson for me in, okay, it's not my place to protect people from themselves. It is to not exploit them, absolutely. But, But there's a line there where people get to make their own choices. Absolutely. I mean, if someone hadn't helped me, you know, because I was the, you know, I was, he wouldn't want to coach me, you know, when I was going through my, you know, prison and rehabilitation and and all sorts of things from drug and alcohol and trauma, you would not have wanted to work with me. I was arrogant. I was difficult. I was defensive, you know, and I was literally putting my two fingers up to the world. Um, But somebody did help me and someone did give me that chance. And as a result, you know, the effect I've been able to have on my own life and other people's life has been, uh, you know, amazing. So yeah, that's why I want to give everybody a chance. You know, everybody deserves that chance if they want it. And absolutely it's not about exploiting them and pushing them into doing something they want, don't want to do, but it's about giving people the opportunity and giving everybody a fair chance. So, com- so we agree on that point. I'm glad. So you, you got into no, no. moving on. How did you become incredibly successful? I mean, let's let's get to that point. I mean, there's a lot of coaches that, you know, do okay. They get some clients, they make some money, they pay their bills. But, but you're, you're up there with, with some, some of the best, best you, you know, know selling books, books, you know, doing all sorts, sorts of fun stuff. stuff. Well, look, um, I, I, I think there's, there's one, <laughs> it's not a sexy answer, but I've been doing yeah. it a really long time. Yeah. I've been coaching professionally for 33 years. I, I, I spoke at a coaching conference um, a few years back, and I, it was a genuine curious question. I said, how many of you have been coaching less than a year? And about half the hands in the room, one to three mm-hmm. years, a bunch more hands, three to five years, not many hands, five to 10 years, three hands, 10 years or more, two hands. And I'm like, okay, so a lot of what you guys are chasing in the success department, y- you haven't earned it yet. I'm not saying you can't make money. It wasn't like I was broke until I was successful, but it is progressive. And the more I'm a big believer, I've been training coaches for the last 13 years professionally. And I am a big believer that you become successful by really, really impacting people. 
Like a friend of mine, Steve Chandler calls it Lazarus marketing. You only need to bring one person back from the dead and they'll talk about you forever. Like if you can really impact people, you will be successful. Most people put way more energy into becoming successful than into becoming impactful. And it's just the wrong way around. So of course there are strategies you can learn. Of course there are things that help, but the number one thing that helps is change the life of every person that you sit with. You're going to do fine. And until you can do that, keep training, keep developing, keep working on your craft, keep working on yourself. But in the end, it's, you know, I love um, the Steve Martin quote, you know, you know, somebody asked him the secret of success and he said something like, be so good, they can't ignore you. Mm. That's the secret of success. Uh, and Rich Litvin as well says just, focus on having very powerful conversations. And I remember I read that book, The Prosperous Coach, and uh, about having powerful conversations. And, and, and I went out and did exactly that. And yeah, that, that that's another testament as to why there's people that, that say, are oh, you exploiting the vulnerable because maybe they don't have so much money or maybe they've come from a difficult background or maybe uh, they look a certain way, right? And it looks like they aren't the kind of person to become a coach. But I was that person. And I did exactly that. You know, I used to meet up with people in Costa Coffee, which is a coffee chain in the UK, if you can remember it when you were living in the UK. And I used to help people for free. And I used to sit down with them and I used to help them and give them absolutely everything that I had. Not just coaching, but mentoring and stories and everything I'd learned in AA and NA and rehab and my own transformation and books. And I just threw it at them. And that's how I started my coaching business. I, okay. So you're the only other person. So I literally spent the first two years of my coaching career having coffee with people. I actually had a booth at the, the, I can't remember the name of the diner, but it's in the movie Swingers in Hollywood. And I would just, I had my, I had a booth and people would come in and sit and we'd have coffee and they'd go and somebody else would come and they, they knew me at the place. And, and I, we called it coffee cup coaching. Um, and I did it. My oh. wife my wife used to really like, when are you going to start charging people? And I was like, I don't know. But there came a point where I did know. I had done it for a couple of years. I'd helped mm. hundreds and hundreds of people. And I was like, oh, I'm ready now. Mm. And I started charging. I've got to do a little plug right now because we actually opened up a, um, a cafe in Bali called Cafe Coach. And it's actually a co-working space and a coffee shop and a restaurant for coaches. And uh, we even have, we even have, coaching cards on the table so you can sit down and have a conversation and ask each other coaching questions and this is for coaches as well as people i'm going to give you your props that is really cool and i have never heard of anyone who did that i like that that's awesome if you're ever in changu in bali we'll make sure we get you a uh it's so often you you often am did you say no all right well you should definitely should cool so you know for those people that, because of course, you know, 33 years in the industry, that is a one way to success. I wasn't, I was just born at that point. <laughs> I'm actually 33 years old. Um, in in later years, I guess that you've, you've done other things. Um, you've written a book. That's a very authoritative thing to do. I should imagine there was some sort of strategic element behind that. Has there been anything else? Because uh, is, is there other things that you can share um, for people that are listening as to? So I'm, I'll be really, not everyone believes me and that doesn't make it not true. I do almost nothing strategically. I, I, I started writing uh, the, the blog that kind of was a big part of my, my career taking off in 2001 because I'd moved to the States and I had a mentor who said, you know, the problem with you is that if somebody's not in the room with you, when you cut, when you say something, it, you never say it again because you got a bit of ADHD. And like, I was like, I don't like repeating myself. Um, and, 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 you, you, you know, and I, and I thought about it and I thought, well, maybe I should write some of this stuff down. And so I literally just started writing down one thing a day. And I thought I'm going to just write something every day. This was before blogging was a big deal even. And I sent it back to, I was working with a company in the UK and there were 13 people. So I sent it to those 13 people and they asked if they could share it. And yeah, yeah, whatever. And soon it was 200 people and then it was 2000 people. And it wasn't until it was 10,000 people on that list. And my son, who was probably seven years old at the time said, dad, if you charged everybody a dollar, you'd be rich. <laughs> like I hadn't thought about that. That came later. 
I didn't do coffee cup coaching so that I could then charge more as a coach. It's what made sense to me to do at the time. Right. I didn't even write a book so that I could use the book to, it was like, I had some stuff to say. I got it literally the story behind the book. I was in Chicago doing a, I was still doing a comedy. So I was performing at a comedy festival in Chicago, got in a cab with this guy from Ghana named Adolf, who was the driver. We just always thought, well, you don't meet many Adolfs. And, and, uh, and we wound up talking for a couple hours after midnight in his cab, snow piling up outside. And I wanted at the end of the conversation, said, hey, you know, give me your email. I'll, I'll send you some stuff. And he was like, oh, I, didn't, I don't have email. No. Back then, kids, not everybody had email. And, and I thought, well, shit, I need to write a book. So I've got something to give people if I can't spend time with them. And that was where the book came from. So all of these things, have they been good marketing? They've been amazing marketing. Did I do any of them to market? Not one. In fact, the few things I've tried over the years to do on purpose rarely have gone well. If you hadn't have had the books, do you think you would have the success that you have now? Well, I think I would have had, if I measure success by clients and impact, yeah, I do. In terms of the rest of my business beyond the coaching, probably not because that's the speaking and the reach. Yeah, that's just it. exposure at a different level. So I don't think the books have been, made the difference to my coaching, but I think they've made the difference to the larger teaching and programs. Do you, do you still coach to to to, to this day? Yeah, no, I I just came off a coaching call and I've got another one after oh. this. <laughs> So that's your core bread and butter. Have you experimented with other forms of coaching, group coaching? Technology oh, based. yeah. No, no. We, we do. Uh, no, we, we've, we've got the full gamut now. We've had time to play with it all. So we do self, self-study self online programs. We do large group online, uh, you know, 500 plus people. It, you know, we do. Uh, I do small group coaching live. I've got a group coming up in London um, in, a, in a couple of weeks. We do, Yeah, no, I play with all the formats. And some of them I really like, and that's why I keep coming back to them. And some of them, it's like, yeah, we could do that, but it's not my thing. So, so it's interesting because I, I'll put my hands up and I'll say, look, I'm passionate about coaching. It's changed my life and I feel compelled to share it with other people. That's why I do it. Um, but I'm also equally a, a passionate entrepreneur. I find entrepreneurialism stimulating and I like the drive of creating a legacy and an impact. And that's a, a, an equally driving force to the point where actually I don't do much coaching anymore and I'm the CEO of a company with a team. Um, do you find yourself not necessarily enjoying, I mean, I'm putting words in your mouth, but I probably should have asked a better question, but you know, are you a coach first, entrepreneur second or... No, um, do you know, it's a, it's a, it, it's a good question. And be, I'm realizing because I don't know the answer to it, but uh, people ask me what my favorite thing about what I, you know, that I do is because I do, I write, I do podcasts. I, I run a company. I, uh, I have, um, you know, I create programs, you know, left, right, and center. Um, and and the honest answer has always been the variety is my favorite thing. Yeah. I don't like getting up and doing the same thing every day. So I like that every day is really different and utilizes different bits of my brain, different bits of my skill set, different bits of what I do. So I don't I don't have an answer in that am I this or this? I'm just a guy who gets to do a lot of things he loves to do and help people. And, and that's a really cool gig, and I would recommend it to anyone. And you and, and you mentioned acting and uh, comedy and things like that, which is really interesting because um, I was very much into acting when I was younger. Still, a, a sort of sideline passion of mine that I haven't been able to haven't been able is probably not the right wording to use, but uh, haven't pursued because uh, I haven't been at a point in my life to be able to do that. But looking to move into that in the, in the in the in the close future, as well as my business partner as well, who's also got an acting degree and very much in that world, seems to be quite a lot of crossover between acting, performing creativity coaching i don't know there's there's this element of you know standing on stage and being this public speaker and this figure and um tell me, tell me a bit more about your acting well, so, yeah so i mean i look i was I, I was famous in wales briefly i i uh i did a sitcom in wales most popular english language sitcom in the 20th century in wales called satellite city 
Um, and I played the I played the New Age American guy. Go figure. Um, and uh, and and it was it, look, it was what I loved to do. And I always sort of did all the coaching and the teaching as a sideline. And then funnily enough, that same trip to Chicago, I got my ultimate career opportunity. So I'm in my 30s. I, my dream was Saturday Night Live, which is the big American sketch comedy show. And I got an, invited to stay in Chicago to work with Second City, which is the feeder troop, one of the two feeder troops for SNL. So it was my like dream come true. And my first reaction was, I just want to go home. And my second reaction was, oh, I guess I'm done with that. And and it was like, I didn't know till I knew, but boy, it was obvious. Mm -hmm. Just been basically handed on a plate the next step to my dream. And it wasn't. And you preferred the coaching, I guess? Did you still but at that there? point, the life that I was living, I mean, whether it was, you know, it was a combination. It was coaching. It was teaching. It was, it, it, it was just, it's just different forms of creative expression. And I mm -hmm. found that I got into a point where being able to express what was coming through me directly instead of through other people's words, you know, through scripts and other people's that was just so much more fulfilling. And I, like I said, I was the last to know when I, I it, it took me courage to go home to my wife and say, I think I'm going to uh, change careers. And she was like, Oh, thank God. I've known for years that you needed to do that. And I'm like, really? Why didn't you tell me? She said, you wouldn't have listened. I was like, you're right. <laughs> okay, cool. So what, what would the, um, perfect sort of 10 years from now scenario look like for you would it be doing exactly what you're doing now have you got to a place in life where you're fully content and you want to maintain that or is there still goals and aspirations that you have i i worked out a while ago that contentment was a great starting place as opposed to a place to get to like it, 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 that was actually a big part of what my first book was about. Happiness leads to success a hell of a lot more often than success leads to happiness. So contentment for me is not where I'm trying to get to. It is, uh, you know, not every day, not every hour, but on the whole, I'm, I'm good. Like, you know, we have, a, we have a saying in our company, overflow, not effort. Like if we're trying too hard, it means there's, we're not full. If, if when we're full up with with life, with presence, with joy, with aliveness, with fun, then everything we do just naturally kind of spills over out into the world. When it starts feeling like no, we got to do more because we got to get here because we got to do that. That to me lets me know, oh, I'm off. So the next ten years, you know, I would love to be as happy, as content as I am now, doing whatever is exciting to me at that point. I'd like to have grandkids by then. If you kids are listening at home, it's times, you know, but, but, but that's, you know, I found that what life has brought me is way better than what I dreamed. Like my dreams were nothing compared to what actually was on offer. So I, I don't, I don't see much cause to, to jump in now and go, well, that's been great life, but what I really want. So you mentioned that what you've got now is what, was much better than what was on offer. What what was it that enabled you to take that better option, that better offer? Well, I think I, I think for me the real turning point was realizing that, uh, and I don't know if this will make any sense, but I, I, I about fifteen years ago I realized that I wasn't broken. Like I sort of built my entire life on the assumption that even though I was broken. I had learned all these things that allowed me to function at a really high level. Like I actually self-defined as a high functioning depressive. Interesting. And, and what, what, just, just quickly, what, what made you feel like you were broken, broken in the first place? place? I didn't understand and no reason I should have understood that what I was suffering from was my, my brain just thought itself into exhaustion. So to me, what I've come to see depression as is when your brain is overworking, depression is like chill. Depression is actually health. It's actually your brain going, you can't keep going at that speed. You can't keep running that level of anxiety through your body. So we're going to just stop the whole thing dead. And if I'd understood that, if somebody had been able to explain that to me, then it would have lasted a couple of weeks and I would have been back. But suddenly I had a disease, suddenly I had a mental illness. And of course, 
you know, when everyone's telling you, you've got a mental illness, I, you're, I was 13. What the hell did I know? And so I started behaving like somebody with a mental illness and I, I learned to cope, but I had a couple of things along the way. So I, I've got a Ted talk called, why aren't we awesomer? And in that Ted talk, I tell the story. It's absolutely true story. I didn't even embellish it of almost dying one night being sucked out a window is what it felt like. I mean, I was obviously having a, a, a paranoid break from reality, but um, and clinging to the walls of the, of the room and phoning the suicide hotline and getting a busy signal. And, and there was something so funny about that to me that it popped, it, it popped me out of it. And I realized the next day that even though I'd thought about almost nothing but killing myself for seven years, I didn't want to. Because I could have that night, if I'd really wanted to die, all I would have had to do was let go of the window. Mm. And and it was the first time I realized that just because I think something doesn't mean it's true. And that one realization multiplied and repeated many, many times that just because you've got thoughts in your head doesn't mean they're what you think. We are not our thinking. We are that which thinks. And so everything that I thought was broken about me was just an innocent misuse of the gift of thought. And when I saw that, and I just heard this guy, I heard this Scottish mystic named Sid Banks say on a video, every human being is sitting in the middle of mental health. They just don't know it. Mm -hmm. And I heard it 15 years ago, and I was just like, that is actually true. I am, I have, there's never been anything fundamentally wrong with me, but boy, did I think there was. And you mentioned it took you 15 years to realize that. When was that? So that was in uh, 2008. So you was already coaching at this point? Oh, I'd been coaching for 18 years. Yeah. I, my first two books are my first two books are about basically how to have a great life, even if you're depressed and anxious and fucked up and neurotic and insecure and <laughs> not just one of them. So you, so it, so it's interesting how this conversation took this turn because it was at, it's, it's, it's your exact story. It's almost like intuitively I knew it. Um, so it really is the message that you don't have to be this well put together, perfect human being in order to help somebody. And I think that's what holds a lot of people back. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that people need to go off and become a life coach, but there are so many things that people have available to them. And there's so many gifts and talents and skills that they have that would, ena that would enable them to make the world a better place, even one person at a time, that they hold back because they feel broken, like you said. And and then actually, that's just a just a story that's circulating in our head, keeping us stuck and keeping us, you know. I noticed with interest that none of the people that I'd helped for the eighteen years I'd been working before I saw that they didn't all it didn't all get undone because I'd seen more. Like I really helped them, and now I'm able to help people more. That's all. Wow. Okay. So, so we're both in the, in the space where we train coaches. So we are advocates for people becoming coaches and making their mark in the world. Is that fair to say? Uh, it, uh, for the right people. Yeah. I don't think everybody okay. needs to be a coach. I think no, the, the, world, the world needs plumbers too. It's like <laughs> true, but the people that want to, the people that have this sort of intrinsic desire to help and serve and make the world a better place, um, which I know there is a lot of, otherwise we wouldn't, you know, have businesses. Um, but they're watching this podcast, they're listening to this podcast and they're feeling like I, I'm not good enough, which we've all had that experience with, or maybe even to a more severe level. What would you say to them to round this off? I, I'd say start similar to what you say, but start with you. Like, like you do really want to be your first client. You, you know, you, it's really hard to give something you don't have. You probably already have a bunch of things that that do work in your life that you can share from. But if I've got a dollar in my pocket, I can't give you 20. Man. So you, you really do have to start where you are. Maybe you're not quite ready, but if you're drawn on that journey, start. Get You'll start. Learn an incredible amount. You don't have to charge people when you start. You didn't. I didn't. That's that's a myth too. But yeah. but if you if you are called to this it is a beautiful life that's what i would say so thank you so much michael for joining us on turning your adversity into an asset it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, enjoy the rest of your day thank you very much all right take care